And welcome everybody, Red Leaf Retrocast, back with another episode, 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 that's how you say that word. <laughs> uh, I'm JD. No, it's always been episode, it's just nobody episode. ever told you. Yeah. Speech impediment, I guess, I've developed in the last 10 seconds. Episode 140, here we are, where it all began. Colin, that was your theme pick, why? Yeah, it seemed like a fun thing to do, just... Take a look at the predecessors of games we've already covered <clears throat> and see how it all started, what kind of baseline the the games were working from, and just take a little trip back to the past so I can tell you all about what was the style at the time, and I'm going to stop at the old man impression. <clears throat> Yeah, we've had a similar theme in the past before a couple times, threequels, uh, sequels, those kinds of things, but uh, I don't recall us ever doing a kind of first iteration where we <laughs> have covered sequels and stuff before. Uh, the common critique, I guess, uh, our podcast seems to be known for. Got a few comments about those things lately. Uh, there's a few, I guess a group of people, this happens every now and again, where like, one person listens and then tells, like, ten friends, and then it's like a group of ten to twelve people all are commenting at the same time. Uh, hmm. Our comments about how we define how good a sequel should be uh, was what they found interesting. So, it's kind of what we're known for, I guess, in the grand scheme. So, uh, in terms of looking at it in, a, in that perspective from this episode, I think it's going to be interesting to kind of see... Uh, since we have covered the sequels, now we have an idea of what the game, I guess, ends up being. But the humble beginnings is a different perspective. I, I quite enjoyed this idea. Yeah, that's what I was hoping for. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Joey. Yes. Playing more Diablo? Uh, actually, not really. I took a little break. I'm waiting for the season. I didn't see the point of playing non-season play when the season's right around the corner. So, I figure I'd take a little break and then get ready to blast when season starts. So, what have but, you been doing uh, in the meantime? I picked up Dave the Diver. been playing that on and off for a little bit now. Nice, kind of relaxing game. And then I picked well, hold up... On. Uh, hold on. You can't just brush over Dave the Diver. What is this game? <laughs> you're Dave and you're a diver. You okay. dive and you... What are you diving Collect for? Fish. You, 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 you know, get fish with your spear gun. You have a sushi restaurant. And, and then slowly as the games, the days <laughs> hey, go well, on. Hold on, like, hold on, hold on. You have a sushi restaurant? Yeah, you had a chef that cooks really good sushi and you just catch the fish for the sushi restaurant. And like, there's, it just, it starts off with very minimal stuff to do, but then it gets to where there's like a lot of stuff to do every day. So are and you trying to keep the sushi restaurant in business, or are you just like a contractor? What's going on here? You're you're yeah, really you, underplaying you, Dave the Diver. That's what it sounds like. You're the manager of the sushi <laughs> place, I think. I'm not sure if you're the owner. You're the manager. Um, but then there's a lot of mysteries with the sea. You run into sea folk. <clears throat> then you get a farm. Then you get Wait, a fish farm. are you farm. telling me there's like mermaids and shit? Yeah. Mermaids and shit. Yeah. Colin, uh, you hear the, this guy? He was going to brush over this game, and this sounds like an expansive, <laughs> like, subnautica level type, oh, it, type story. It going. does yeah. get so expansive. It starts it off really so does. simple, and then it just gets more and more and more. All right, I'm looking this uh, up. <laughs> it's, it's fun. It's a relaxing fishing game that sometimes you have to attack giant octopuses or uh, <laughs> a hermit crab that has a Tonka truck on its back. Or, what? I mean, it's actually like a dumb truck, not a tonk truck, but it looks like a tonk truck. Um, but it's a fun game. I, I'm enjoying it. Dave the Diver on Steam came out June 28th. Okay, so recent game. Recent game. Unity Engine. All right. It's an action RPG adventure game. Oh, it's going to be on the Switch later in 2023. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I would recommend God it. damn. It's it's fun because the way the days split up, there's morning, afternoon, and then the nights generally for sushi. But you can spend a third of the night doing night fishing for to catch night fish. But generally, you can spend one day just collecting fish because you need to get ten fish a day just so you can do sushi. But eventually, you get enough fish that you have plenty. But then you have to start worrying about getting expensive fish because you have enough staff that it gets costly. So you have to actually sell expensive sushi to keep that afloat. So. 
it just slowly gets you into all the management stuff. It doesn't hit you with everything all at once, which is kind of nice. Neat. And then I started playing Infamous Second Son. Oh finally. my god. He Okay, so the the game has like three premise, three three different story premises where in the morning he essentially go dives the sea to sell shit on eBay essentially. <laughs> then the afternoon he manages the sushi restaurant. <laughs> oh, that's at night. Yeah. So yeah, it's And it's, then you play the sushi restaurant at night. Yeah. And there's yeah, boss gets, fights? Yeah, there's but there's it gets more and more complicated and they add in different there's like it feels like every time I play there's a new mechanic that's involved. Mm-hmm. So sometimes when you catch a fish, you just have to smash space bar to fill it up to catch them. Sometimes you have to like hit the right uh combination of ASD or W, depending on what shows up. Sometimes you have to move the mouse clockwise or counterclockwise. So there's a lot of interesting things. This seems like game of the year. That's <laughs> that's a. I mean, how'd you come across that, this game? A streamer I saw played it, and usually plays horror games. So when he started playing this, it was like interesting. Okay, <laughs> well, it could be a horror game, I guess. I mean, there's <laughs> elements of it, but no, it's it's <laughs> a nice, relaxing game for the most part. I I mean, a, a lot of the Switch. fish don't attack you, but then there are fish and sharks that will attack you. I'm so getting this game on Switch. This sounds so much fun. <laughs> you get your harpoon gun, which is your basic fishing thing, but then you also get guns that work underwater. So right now I have like a level two sniper with fire damage. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. No, the game's a lot of fun. It just gets to the point where you have to think of, do I want to start the next day or should I save and take a break? Because once you get into a day, they're now taking longer and longer with all the extra things they got to do. I love this. And then there's like, game so much. There's like special events that come up. Like one of them was like a jellyfish event. So people are coming to want jellyfish dishes and whatnot. And then I just went through a tuna fish event that people want tuna. And that one I made a shit ton of money because tuna is expensive. So every once in a while there's events that you have to get ready for for sushi or you get VIP clients. Like I had, I forget what they called them, but pretty much Michael Bay showed up and I had to make <laughs> make him a dish. Did it so, involve an explosion? <laughs> everything was explosion about it, but I forget what his name was, but it, it I thought something with explosion, but yeah, we had to do an explosive dish for him. All right. <laughs> I've looked up jellyfish recipe. So. A jellyfish salad has come up. <laughs> this is a bunch of different jellyfish It actually looks sushis. pretty good. It looks like a seaweed salad, kind of. Yeah, well, there's like special jellyfish in this game that... Or heavy, so yeah, you gotta you gotta upgrade your suit and guns and things so you can dive deeper, carry more, have more air and all that. So yeah, one it's... package of jellyfish packed in salt, about ten ounces, two tablespoons garlic, minced, two green onions, and then it keeps going on. This looks really good. Of course, mi- of course, mix uh, some soy sauce and sesame oil. Got to. Yeah, ridiculous. This looks good. You wouldn't try a s- jellyfish salad. Uh. Probably not, because I don't think the consistency would be good. Spicy jellyfish salad, secret to good skin. Extremely Ah. refreshing, nutritious, and extremely tasty. Neato. Okay. So yeah, I played that, and then as I said, which you're still fixated on that, I played a second son, infamous, finally. What do you mean, finally? That's the first time I played second son. (laughs) It has been out for what ten years now. I could have. Yeah, I, I, I still got it that, myself. No, I've only played the first two. I've never had a PS4. Are you sure? So, yeah, I've literally never played Second Son. I'm a, I'm a, I must be remembering a different conversation than with somebody. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, Second Son is the only one I haven't played because I didn't have a PS4. So you even I got that sick played. DLC thing that goes with it too. Uh, the like. It's 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 the got detective this like pur- one. Yeah, it's like purple and pink and stuff on the cover and everything. Yeah, it's but like I don't... first light. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Really worth it unless you're the links are still up. I don't think the links are still up, so it's kind of pointless. Well, I think if you buy Second Sun now, it comes with it or something. 
Yeah, I, I mean, it's in it. I started playing some of it, but yeah. it's like, you got to go online and do this. And I was like, eh, uh, I'm just going to go do my second playthrough. So I play through good for the first playthrough, and now I'm playing evil. So what's your opinion of Second Son, <laughs> since it's like 10 years old? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. So far, it seems like, I mean, I've only done one good or bad decision on the second playthrough, but it was the first one. It doesn't matter what you selected. It's the same story. So I'm hoping the later decisions actually have impact but it's not really looking like it what's um is... what's your opinion compared to the first two games in terms of like story and gameplay obviously the graphics are going to be a huge leap in improvement yeah graphics are nice um having the three different types of powers is interesting but i wish they would maybe more like coexist instead of just having to switch from one to another because mm, I, I got to the point where i never went back to smoke unless it forced me to because it's such so much weaker than the other two. Yeah. Especially like I, the ultimate. Yeah, I remember I dabbled in the game a little bit and then I got caught up with other PS4 games uh at the time. So it it fell into that I played it for a couple hours and then kind of put it down kind of deal. So I yeah, don't I'm, really remember I mean, too much of it. There's a lot of sections that you have to like do a lot of side missions through to get like shards and whatnot. And I think yeah, it sounds there right. might be a little too much of that because that's pretty much what the whole game is. I think the actual story is not that long, but getting everything else done is time consuming. Okay. So, but I should have. I'm kind of rushing through the second one here. I'm able because there's like the side missions to find a secret. Uh, cameras you don't even have the starter you can just shoot the camera so i just shoot them even before i can do the mission because i know where they are so. yeah it came out during that era where like watchdogs was going around and uh those kinds of games it's very ubisoft-esque <laughs> yeah i mean but it opened up to like where they could open the story again because i know the first two kind of close it off with the event and they're like oh we got conduits everywhere and then we just the main guy died and everything just kind of stopped this one opens up to potential more but from what I read, it's not on the docket for them making another game, which sucks. Yeah, the infamous <laughs> franchise has has a lot of legs to it, I think, still, uh, especially yeah, but... with the way games are made today. But then again, it could fall into that Tomb Raider trap. Remember when we talked about Revelations a few podcasts ago where, you know, it's like, OK, it's a good game, but we've also played this like six times. <laughs> Yeah, but I think this one was slightly different enough than the other one because the other one was like a kind of a personal story with the guy, and I forget what the second story was about for the second game. I know we had to stop the giant thing coming down the coast, but I forget. Yeah, I remember you and I played through the whole it. first game like in a like a day or two when I was visiting, and then we started yeah, and that the story second. was amazing. Yeah, and then we started the <laughs> second game. It's like this isn't as good as the first one, is it? <laughs> It was still good, technically. The story was weaker, but, I mean, you can't really top that first story. That one was yeah. just really good. But they have a premise where they can go from places where you can still have conduit versus bioterrorists since it seems like all the conduits have been released, so there could be problems okay. with people stepping up. We took down the organization that was in charge of keep them in check, but they were, you know, a shitty ass government organization. So I could see this sort of story going multiple different ways. So I think they could still keep it fresh. Alrighty. Colin. Video games. Give me some. What you been doing? Well I started playing Castle Crashers. Oh my God. That brings that that I haven't heard that in a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. There's a remaster on Switch. I really? played it. <clears throat> yeah, I feel I've had it for I a while. That once upon a time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my my nephews were over last weekend, and since we already beat Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge, we just had to try something else. So I pulled out Castle Crashers, and it turned out to be more fun than I expected. And the slightly edgy sense of humor really helps a lot. Right. <laughs> I yep. mean, it is a new. It is a Newgrounds game. <laughs> I mean, in one of the levels, there's this huge enemy off screen that's advancing with big thumping footsteps that shake the ground like the T-Rex from Jurassic Park. And so all the animals on screen start shitting uncontrollably. 
And you can even ride on deer that are shitting so hard that it propels them like a rocket. Mm -hmm. So, needless to say, my nephews were laughing their heads off the whole time. <clears throat> and I also started playing uh, Bloodstained Ritual of the Night. Oh, finally. Yeah, uh, very much familiar with that one. <laughs> <laughs> the the end game is very difficult. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, so far so good. Although the the Zangetsu boss fight was really hard. I don't know if I was under leveled or what, but there's there's definitely a sense in that entire game where you ha you feel like you're under leveled and you're not properly equipped with X Y and Z. Um, the game was like. In the in between of being a good game and just an average game, like that's how I felt throughout it. I was like, okay, I enjoy playing this. This is good, but something's missing throughout the whole time. Yeah, I'm kind of getting that sense too. I mean, I also found the whip weapons really unwieldy, which is strange for what is supposed to be a Castlevania game and everything but name. Yeah, what did I use? I feel like I used a sword the entire time, or something. Yeah, I tend to. I tend to alternate between sword and gun if I have enough ammo. But I'm enjoying it for the most part, so I'll still be playing more. I played a tiny bit of the System Shock remake. Okay, tell me about that. I was curious, because uh, you mentioned that in the last podcast. Well, it's, graphics are m definitely much better than the original System Shock. Because if you've ever <laughs> looked at a screenshot of that game, it just looks like a complete mess. Right. And it's pretty fun so far. I mean, most of what I've done is just like the opening cutscenes and getting to getting through a small part of the first level. <laughs> like at one point, the your character is in the middle of a hacking job, and then a whole bunch of cops show up with guns and like turn around hand behind your head and the guy actually flips him off <laughs> so the guy knocks him out with his gun and then yeah there's really not much more to say about that most most of what i've done is gather a few resources kill a few zombies and solve one wire puzzle which unlike bioshock where you like stick the stuff in there it's uh, you're actually like spinning around the, the different circuits okay. to create a complete circuit. Right. So that's a it's an interesting little twist on that little puzzle. But I haven't played much further than that. So I'll probably be keeping you guys up to date throughout the casts. Yeah, I'm interested in hearing more about that. So for those that uh, may be joining for the first time or maybe forgot, uh, we played a while ago the System Shock uh, game on a podcast. Uh, well, we easily... played System Shock 2. Yeah, System Shock 2. So there's a there, there, we definitely have perspective on what this remake uh, should and could be. Um, so I'm interested in, in continuing to hear about this, Colin. All righty. And... It's pretty much everything I've been playing besides podcast games, but I do have a question I'd like to pose to both of you. Okay. Since, since we're going back to the past with this topic, more or less, I'm wondering if there are in, in the episodes from before we started giving letter grades, are there any games that stand out to you that are so good you would give an A or S to them, or so bad you'd give an F or a low D? I know I'm kind of springing this on you at the last minute. Um, but. Well, let's see. If memory, I mean, like if I go back and I'm looking at like uh, episode one here of space, uh, Super Metroid is definitely up there for an A. A uh, I would, maybe. I would give a NHL 94 an A or maybe an S. I mean, there's a game Alrighty. we played for this podcast uh, that I'd like to reference. Um, episode five was first person shooter. I there, there's something about that very first Medal of Honor that I just am really in love with. Uh, that's probably an oh, A yeah. A for me. 
That'd be interesting to just uh, take time at the beginning of the podcast um, for future episodes and just kind of go through episodes one, two, three until we and just give it letter grades with a very with a uh, just with a basic thought of it. If you've played it before, obviously yeah. I've played all these and would have to remember. <laughs> yeah, and but, I wasn't around for the first fifteen episodes, but right or fourteen episodes, but. I can give letter grades to stuff I have played. Yeah, you've been on this uh, podcast, Colin, since February 2018. Yeah. Yeah. I brought it up because one of the games we're covering is a prequel to, or predecessor, uh, from our time travel episode. And then that got me thinking how Chrono Trigger is an easy S, and Time Splitters 2 is definitely an A. Then, I would give Tumba an A. I love that game. That game's really fun. Yeah. I... Yeah. And then Descent get I'm kinda undecided between an A and an S. And Prince of Persia Sands of Time and Sly Cooper both get S's. When did we start giving the tier grades? Was that like a, f- a couple years ago? Um, yeah, the from sheet, epi- 59 like, looks like when we first start recording it. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know if we gave it before that or not. No, but and, and I don't think so. I would think it was yeah. just pass fail kind of situation. What was your yeah. favorite? We've always and kept that. favorites. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'd have yeah. to I'd have to go back and look at everything uh, for sure. <clears throat> Definitely. I mean, to give examples of shitty games, oh, well. <laughs> uh, S- Skate or Die de- gets an easy F, as does Ghostbusters on NES. Yeah, those games kind of stand out immediately, don't they? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I remember. Um, I remember it was either you or Josh or some or or Kevin would always like reference the angry video game nerd and just like slip in one of those terrible games <laughs> where we were doing like five to 10 an episode. Yeah. 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 I had a, let's just say I had a lot more free time back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so true. Yeah. My job in Canada allowed me a lot of video game time. It was phenomenal. I can tell. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean that, yeah, that time, that time my life was much more, um, much more focused on video games, I would definitely say, uh, and anime. It was just one, two. Yeah, you're cutting out. Yep. Yep. I would, um, then I'd watch like a wrestling show on the weekend or something, uh, much more into wrestling these days from a historical perspective, but you know, people change and do things over time. Uh, is that it, Colin? That's everything I've got. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, I mentioned I bought Final Fantasy 16 on the last episode. I have played a few hours of it uh, in between, uh, for what it's worth. And it's definitely very story based. Um, it feels kind of linear, uh, especially in the early stages. And I don't really have an issue with that. It's it's um it's definitely taken a lot from the Final Fantasy VII remake. Uh, whether it's the engine, the graphics, the layout, that kind of thing, it's very much in that uh, that realm of how to play. And I'm very okay with that because I thought the Final Fantasy uh, remake was done extremely well. So I was so if I because I couldn't help but compare how this turned out to to Final Fantasy 15 with the leather jackets and the desert start and pushing the car and you know walking around <laughs> talking to uh hillbilly sin Sid and that kind of sh- that kind of stuff um but uh they definitely gone back to the more medieval sense of sense of things uh epic epic giant fights uh lots of like gene uh, gene supremacism. Is that a word? Sure. Why not? Um, <laughs> uh, this, I mean, it's, it's, it's about 
warring countries, uh, very classic. Uh, it really gave me a lot of vibes of like Final Fantasy four and six kind of storytelling and how they go about doing that with the kings and queens. And if your country loses, you essentially become a slave. And they have uh, facial tattoo markings to, you know, let everyone know you're less than less than human and you'll be treated as such kind of deal. So the the morality, of course, is slaves are bad, must treat everyone equally. And it wa- it kind of amused me that there were there's actual critics out there going, oh, this game is so offensive. I can't believe that they 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 would make light of slavery like this or make a game about slavery. I'm like, well, no shit. Like, come on. <laughs> like, I don't know. It just it seems like such a, a reach to critique something over that when, yeah, slavery is bad. Duh. <laughs> like, we know this. <laughs> why, why is yeah, this, no shit. Why is this so controversial? <laughs> just people looking for shit. Uh, as for. Exactly. Yeah. Even as for the gameplay, it's very much what we've expected out of the last however many Final Fantasies now where it's very much more action based in feeling. Uh, very hack and slashy, you know? And again, I don't really have an issue with that. It's kind of what Final Fantasy has become. It's where these games have kind of focused on. I don't expect turn-based strategy type elements in my RPGs anymore. Uh, I'm enjoying my time with it. Uh, but now I'm really like looking at all these games I have piled up that I want and want to play. And I say this seemingly every podcast, I have to just like pick a game and play it. That isn't a podcast game. You know, I just, I just really have to focus on what I want to play. And it's, it's really just, I pick up something for an hour, put it down, don't play it for like three months. And then I do it again. (laughs) And eventually I just end up beating like 10 games in a row. I don't want to do that. Nice. You know. So I got to I got to I just got to pick something and come up with some idea of what I want to do. Uh, so my initial impressions of Final Fantasy 16 are good. I, I quite enjoy it. It's definitely one of the better games I've bought in the last however many months to a year. Uh, which is sad because I, I bought God of War Ragnarok and just like never picked it up. I haven't put it in. I haven't played it, guys. <laughs> Don't feel bad. Neither have I. Uh, it's terrible. We're terrible, Colin. <laughs> We're lazy bastards. Yeah, uh, I wouldn't say lazy. It's just not a priority, I guess. But all right, I'm going to play a drop. We can get into our two games of the podcast. Here we go. <laughs> Okay, Colin, introduce the theme, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so it's where it all began. Games that are the predecessors, or rather the beginning of the series for certain games that we've already covered on the cast. Just to see where everything started, what kind of baseline those games were working from, and just give our thoughts on how they compare. What was improved upon? What was missing from future entries? You get the picture. So, I forget which order I put them in on the on the sheet. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna wing it. First game is Super Smash Bros. on N64, developed by HAL Laboratory and published by Nintendo. Released on the Nintendo 64 in Japan on January 21st, 1999. And in North America on April 26th, 1999, and in the EU on November 19th, 1999. Now, I chose this one because we did Super Smash Bros. Brawl earlier this year, and I wanted to revisit it for my own personal nostalgia. Because I remember playing the shit out of this game with my friends growing up. Just like at different houses, we'd... Or I'd even have like a rental from a rental N64 from Blockbuster and play with friends that way. And it's it's pretty much 
It, it's a series that pretty much needs no introduction. Every single iconic Nintendo character coming together and beating the shit out of each other. But Mario beating up Link or Samus, or Donkey Kong beating up Pikachu, you get the picture. <laughs> and, yeah, this, this game was always really fun. It's like, I mean, the controls are a bit more stiff and awkward than I remember, but maybe that's just because of the controller, <laughs> or I've been spoiled by the later games. That is my biggest complaint. Oh, yeah. I hate the controls. Every time I was trying to turn and attack, I guess I was turning before the tick, so I didn't turn. I just kept attacking the same direction, and it kept killing me from doing that. Ah, that, that's too bad. Yeah, it might have just might have been a controller thing. I mean, and to answer everyone's burning question, my main is Samus for this one. <laughs> find her easier to control than Link. I mean, Link is my other main for future games, but Samus was mine for this. It was only in later games that I found them to be more equal. I always gravitated and, towards like Donkey Kong or Fox. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so many of my friends really loved Kirby. Everybody loved Kirby. You suck him up and <laughs> then you jump off the stage. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's the troll character. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I guess uh I guess the theme for me in these two games was very much nostalgia based. Yeah. Um like uh, I've said in the past, uh didn't have an N64 growing up, but all my friends did. <laughs> so anytime Smash or well, it's particularly the N64 Smash, um Mario Kart Anything involved, uh, uh, Ocarina of Time, anything involving N64, I'd have to play at my friend's places, and it was always, uh, Smash would always be put up eventually, uh, I'd play that for a little bit, and then when we got tired, we'd start playing the single player type games on there, um, along with various wrestling games and whatnot, but anyways, uh, Smash was always the party game, it was always the, you know, weekend sleepover game. So definitely a lot of nostalgia here, and hit, uh, the controls have not aged well by any means. Uh, yeah, I for also, sure. Yeah, I also realized <laughs> my N64 collection that I have now, uh, I do not have <laughs> Smash on the N64 for it. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd think I would, uh, but I don't. So definitely had to uh, find a different means to play it uh, outside the original. The I rem I remember and it came back very quickly. The stage played the most was the Star Fox uh, ship level that was always the most popular. Oh yeah, yeah. What about you guys? Yeah, that... what was what was always the stage for you guys? Yeah, it was the Star Fox stage mostly. Yeah. Sometimes Hyrule Castle, sometimes Donkey Kong Jungle, but mostly Star Fox. Why was why is that? Why was that? Never under I never really got it, you know. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure myself. I mean, it's just because it's big and spread out, and there's also just the one ledge, and maybe people liked getting people, seeing other people blasted away by the ship's engines if they were trying to hang off the back. That's true. I don't know. It's, yeah, I guess. People just found that to be the the most uh, the most ah I don't know what the word is. I, know, I was always fond of the Pokemon stage personally. Oh yeah, yeah, I like that one too. Yeah, Saffron City. Yeah, you you could fall through the the buildings. Uh, th the thing would spit out Pokeballs all the time with uh, lots of item drops. That stage was always my my favorite. But yeah, it's always the Starbucks yeah. stage. Not not really. Entirely sure why that one appealed to my friends the most. What about you, Joey? Uh, I mean, never really played this growing up. Fighting games aren't my thing. But I do remember playing Star Fox and Pokemon. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, one thing I really like about this game compared to the sequels, it's the, it's the animations from whenever each character enters the stage. Oh, like yeah. Link. 
you know, Link comes down in a column of light, Pikachu comes out of a Pokeball, Mario comes out of a green warp pipe. You get the picture. Yeah. I don't think any of the sequels did those animations. I mean, I get it would be a lot of work to make animations for every individual character because of how big the casts got, but I still kind of wish they would. I mean, in general, I kind of feel like this game has a bit more personality than the sequels. Well, yeah, there's only like, what, 10 characters? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, as great as Ultimate is, it doesn't have that same kind of Nintendo feel to it that the original has. But maybe I'm just being a grumpy old man saying that. Although I did look it up and how Laboratories were the ones who developed the first two games and the rest were done by other studios like Sora Limited, Game Art, and Bandai Namco. So that would explain why they feel different. Right. Much bigger staff uh, to get involved and do everything and make all the characters even. Yeah. And adding all the features. Yeah. And one last thing I want to comment on is I always liked the sound design for this game. I mean, to me, it's one of the games that really epitomized what N64 games sounded like, with the other being Ocarina of Time. I don't know how to describe it. It's just how it sounds. Just take. It's very distinct. It's like I hear what's coming from that, and I immediately think N64. Yeah, you get that kind of same feel with like Genesis games where it's got that twanginess to it all. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like a synthesizer type with with the N64, you always got the I always described it as like kicking a punching bag. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, so that's about right. <laughs> Every everything's got that oomph to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was yeah. ever? Oh wait, no, I already asked you guys. <laughs> yeah, what were your mains? But it was. Hi. It's definitely a game that's built off the simplicity, but has enough depth to it where you keep coming back. Uh, the single player, I, I definitely found myself. You know, it's it's like I remember the single player being way better, but it was really just comes down to the the last boss battle because I remember yeah. having a lot of conversations about. Uh, future Smash games where the single player is just uh, the story doesn't mean much. It's everyone's very overly critical of it. And then I found myself playing through this one. I'm like, this isn't any better. <laughs> like, I don't know why people thought the single player was ever good in the first place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fighting Glover at the end <laughs> essentially is a weird choice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That controls them. Come on, JD, that's deep. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's got a point there. Yeah. I remember some of the unlock requirements for certain characters being really strict. Like everybody, way back when, everybody talked about how hard it was to get Ness unlocked. I remember Basically, none of that because, like I said, it was always at my friend's place and those things were already unlocked. And yeah, yeah. I just, I was just like, I have no idea how to unlock any of these. So what, <laughs> what, is, what is that like? Well, from from what I looked up, it's like you're you have to clear the the one player mode on normal difficulty without getting a game over. Okay. And that can be that can be a bit of a challenge. Well, if I guess you my haven't... friends never had any issues. <laughs> that was unlocked for everybody. <laughs> or, or they just had a shitload of time on their hands. Well, you are as a kid. Kids tend to do. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, hey, I, I give this a pass. Yeah, I pass it. Uh, besides the aged controls, I don't really see anything particularly like bad about the game or wrong or, you know, every single Smash since then has expanded upon this iteration. So, you know, I'll, pa I'll pass Smash. I'm going to fail it. Ooh, Joey, what? harshness. Ooh, boo. <laughs> I don't see a point going back to playing this one. Well, I mean, when you put it that way, it's like, yeah, the, the games have gotten so expansive where it's like, okay, yeah, it's just this game with more shit. <laughs> yeah. Why so bother playing it? First? But in terms of like when it is and what it did. No, I'm failing no? it because no. it's, it's how so, I want to go back. Do I okay. think All you right. should go play it or not? And I uh, think not. Okay, that's where you're too stiff. At it. Okay, okay. 
fine. Okay. Mr. Killjoy over here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, we'll move <laughs> on to the next one, then. Hey, I'll kill your joy in the next one, too. Oh, I didn't boy. like it either. <laughs> Joey. Uh, Joey hates fun. <laughs> Yeah, fuck your fun. Yeah. Fuck your fun. Yeah, just look at F Y F. Look at all bitch. the shit. <laughs> just look at all the shitty games he made us play this year. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fuck your fun. Well, I shall have my revenge. I've that's got tag a topic. For, that's tagline for this episode. On the, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mark that down. Fuck your fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna say in iTunes. It's gonna say episode 140. Where it all began. Fuck your fun. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ever looked at the iTunes things? iTunes no. and, and Spotify. So usually I, it'll it'll have like the table of episodes and everything and then when it goes to description, it'll only show like the first sentence that you put in the description. So for every single episode, that's why I have just that one sentence. It's like a tagline for the episode. <laughs> Because un- unless oh, you expand, later. yeah, unless you expand the description. So if you go on like the iTunes table, it has just all those one-liners. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's purely there to pop myself. <laughs> yeah, just keep it behind closed doors, would you? Yeah, well, what? <laughs> anyway, you said pop yourself. Yeah, that's pop how myself. you pop yourself. Yeah, that's how I pop myself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Keep it in private, would you? All right, that's a wrestling term, Colin. Just to let you know. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, you should. I just know thought that. you were attacking him. Well, keep know. your wrestling in private, dude. I don't want to know what you do in the bedroom. Whoa. <laughs> Is that what you and Megan call it, Joey? Wrestling? No, we call it wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Cut promos on each other. I'm going to get you so hard in that bed tonight, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you have good savings because I'm going to stroll over that bed tonight. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, oh man. man. That's great. Okay. Well, we, we could go on and on about that. Okay. Uh, next next game, yeah, Colin. We're, we're getting off track. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. It's too good, but it'll go on too long. We can't do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Next game is Time Splitters for PlayStation 2. Developed by Free Radical Design and published by Eidos Interactive. Hey, them again. We've been talking about them a lot this year. Jesus, we there's so many Eidos games. Yeah. And it was released on PlayStation 2 in North America on October 26, 2000, and in the EU on November 24, 2000. And I chose this one because it's the predecessor to Time Splitters 2, which we covered years ago on the time travel topic. Yep. How appropriate, since we're going back to the past of games we've done, and this is a time travel game. Now, unfortunately, my copy of this game did not come in the mail fast enough, so I was limited to YouTube videos for this one. Now, the plot is very minimal, but oh, I'll, read a, <laughs> I'll read a... I'll read a... Summary according to Game Facts. It's like in the I hundred mean, years. Yes, there was a story. It was more like just drop you into a level and go. <laughs> yeah, yeah level is more of like speed run to this thing and run back. Yeah, I can't say yeah, there was yeah. much story. You know what? I bet you the entire story is laid out in the game manual. Yeah, I guess so. I bet I mean, it's very old school it... like that. Well, here's what it says on uh, Game Facts. It says, in the hundred years spanning the millennium, which is 1935 to 2035, a disparate bunch of heroes and villains battle against their own challenges. Although each is unaware of the others, they all share an ageless common spirit of adventure. But unknown to them, their daring actions have attracted the attention of the Time Splitters, who are an evil race dwelling outside of time and space. For eons, they have manipulated the fate of humanity for their own malign ends. With cursed shards of crystal, they have sown fear, greed, and conflict throughout history. Now roused from an ancient sleep, the time splitters cross the threshold from their shadowy dimension, ripping through the fabric of time itself to confront our heroes. Can our heroes unite against a common enemy to realize a greater destiny? Or will humanity be consigned forever to a realm ruled under the shadow of the time splitters? Mm. 
Well, I can say immediately that the second game story was way better than this one. <laughs> Absolutely. The single player mode was infinitely better. And uh, I made a mistake when I first uh, booted this up. I yes. started playing the third game at first. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. And uh, I was like, this game looks there? really good for like 2000. Uh, and for those that don't know, it's called Time Splitters Future Perfect. It's not called Time Splitters 3. I uh, didn't like look it up at first. I just go, oh, Time Splitters, because a game. Usually it would have. Because <clears throat> usually the first game always has like some expanded title, and then they go to n number two and three. So I went, this doesn't feel right. It seems like way better than I expected. <laughs> So I played like <laughs> half an hour and I went, I got to look this up. Oh, Future Perfect is the third game. OK, let's turn this well, off. Let's boot I up. I get how uh, you did that, too, because I was looking at videos for the first one. Seems someone like I was like, someone could probably speed run this. And I kept getting Future Perfect. I was like, what the fuck is this Future Perfect shit? <laughs> well, I'm glad I wasn't the only one that made that mistake. Yeah, Future Perfect came out in 2005. The first game came out in 2000. So a bit different. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And also the third yeah. game was made by EA and that's very noticeable when you start it. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh but anyways, I did end up playing the first one and yeah, I'll I'll uh Joey, I'm wondering if you got this this uh impression at first. I thought I was playing Red Faction. I didn't say Red Faction. It kind of felt like Oh no, I forget what it like uh, Perfect Dark or something. Kind of, uh, but uh, damn it, uh, it kind of felt like Golden Eye to me. Yeah. But okay, worse. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the things I was gonna point out. One of the first things you'll notice is that's pretty much Golden Eye slash Perfect Dark with better graphics. I mean, so the like shittier aim. The, the aiming felt so bad to me. Oh, the aiming yeah. is is like Auto Doom esque. That's what was coming across. Yeah. The reason why I'm I'm comparing it to uh, Red Faction is, well, Joey and I played many, many years of Red Faction 2 multiplayer, and yeah. uh, the story mode was very much kind of this linear, just shooty, shooty, gun, gun, pow, pow thing with, like, no depth to it at all. So, but the multiplayer was super in-depth with the bots and the uh, customization of the bots and you can create them and do whatever you want. And time splitters, this first one was exactly like that. Uh, so I'm like, okay, I immediately like go, okay, this is a multiplayer game. First single player. Second, that's, that's my initial. Uh -huh. I never touched the multiplayer. The single player game pissed me off enough that I didn't even I, <laughs> I, check I, I everything can, else out. Yeah. I can tell you right away, Joey, if we had, uh, Time Splitters, this first game before Red Faction Two, we would have been playing this one. It's it's uh -huh. very much along that same same line, and it's very smooth, very responsive controls. Uh, there's lots of depth to the multiplayer. Uh, now the single yeah, player, I, I thought was kind of ass. Ah uh, yeah, yeah, I did not like the single player at all. Yeah, and I hate running over certain guns, and it always changed to it. Yes. I don't want to change to the shotgun every time I run over a shotgun. Yeah, so you find yourself avoiding uh, guns to change. Um, I played three levels, and there's only, I think, seven uh, to Time Splitters. But uh, I, I think there's ten. Yeah, but. there's there's there's. I mean, there's there's a lot, uh, a lot of levels for sure, because they they take a while. But there's a lot of flaws to it, like heavily. Uh, it's very hard. Uh, your health depletes extremely quick. And you have to complete the level in one go. So if you die, you start completely over. So that sucks. Uh, and that's mostly because the premise is, like Joey, you said at the start, was get dropped on a level, go to the end, get the thing, and then you have to run all the way back. Well, my god, did I die three times in a row grabbing the thing and running back and getting shot in the back without knowing it, and I died. And the second game. level, the Chinese level, even on easy was fucking hard for me. It felt like the enemies never missed. They don't. And sometimes I got shot when I was behind a wall, and I don't know how that happened. Yeah, uh, not a lot of protection, especially on that level in particular. Uh, going through the triads in the restaurant was kind of annoying. Um, I'll tell you what the worst one was. 
is the like haunted mansion level with the zombies. They all have shotguns. That made me rage quit. Oh no. Yeah, that 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 was the last straw there. Uh whatever level number that is. That could actually be much later. Maybe I played more than I thought. Uh, yeah, I only played the first two levels, so I don't know what you're talking about. <clears throat> yeah, that level was was that that level can go to hell. <laughs> Cuz if you <laughs> if you imagine you died easily on the others and your health went away, imagine every enemy has a shotgun now. Yeah, that sounds pretty pretty yeah. cheap. Yeah, get, that's what it felt like. It felt cheap. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to point out the reason this game feels like GoldenEye or Perfect Dark is because the developers for Free Radical Design are mostly ex-Rare employees. Huh, that makes sense. They're the ones who worked on GoldenEye. And there's we go and there's more detail about it in the time travel episode about time tra- with time splitters too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Now it makes sense yeah, why wh- the the multiplayer would have been the focus then. Yeah, it seems that way. Yeah. Now I was going to point out that's one improvement Time Splitters 2 has over this one is that there are actual checkpoints in the stage. Checkpoints, story, uh yeah, every everything was an improvement in Time Splitters 2. Yeah. Really makes me Yeah, there's like a... Time Splitter 2 more. <laughs> more. Most definitely. Uh, that's pretty much everyone's opinion. Time Splitters 2 is this game, but much improved. Uh, the first time Splitters was a PS2 exclusive. I didn't know that. Yeah, that made that made things a little difficult for me in terms of getting a copy. I even went to a, a game store that supposedly had one in stock, but then they looked and they're like, ah, no, we don't have it. It's like, fuck, you guys need to update your fucking inter- website database. Yeah. <laughs> You're just lucky I had other things to do while I was out. But yeah. Yeah, this... uh, I mean, yeah, you guys fit on the single player, but there were some some features that were fairly ahead of its time. I mean, there was the co-op multiplayer. There was a level editor. I don't know if... I don't know how many people have used that. I don't know, maybe people were just using the Half-Life level editor all this time. Uh, I kind of looked looked into it a little bit, and it was very bare-bones basic. Uh, you could never make anything nearly... Oh, yeah. You could never make anything nearly as good or in-depth yeah, I don't know what. As, as the um, original levels. Like, no, no question about that. Yeah, you're kind of drifting in and out. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. But go on. Yeah, one one thing I really didn't like about the, the single player is that there's no death animation like in GoldenEye and Perfect Dark. Just jump straight to the game over screen. That just <laughs> yeah. felt really jarring to me. Now, the game does have a bit of a quirky sense of humor, like when you're choosing the characters. Like in the, the 1935 Egypt mission, you choose the guy, he'll chug down a whole flask of who knows what and throw it away before the mission starts. My kind of guy. Or in, And in the 1970 Chinese mob mission, the, the guy character will comb his hair and check his nails. Some ladies will do like this go-go dancer move in certain levels. Gotta look good when you do everything. Colin. And in the more fut- <laughs> yeah. And in the more futuristic levels, some of the weapons are literally called sci-fi handgun or sci-fi auto rifle. So that was kind of funny. And I'm pretty sure that mansion stage is supposed to be a nod to Resident Evil, since there's all the zombie enemies. Uh, you can only kill them by decapitating them. Yeah, it, it was very House of the Dead. That's that's what I'd compare it to. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Also, the deer heads mounted on the walls have gun turrets built into them. Oh, the turrets in this game are so that was kind of awful. Especially when there's enemies in front of them. With this slight auto-aim, you can't really... At least I did. Had 
I really struggled to try to take them out. So I end up running by a lot of stuff because you just get super easily overwhelmed all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought for the time the, the graphics were pretty good and I like the music in a lot of stages. Yeah, music was good. It's very yeah. noticeable once you start the Egypt level. Yeah, for sure. And not sure what else. I'm not sure what more I can say about this one. I I think it's I a great overall, game if, I... if you want multiplayer. Uh, can't really recommend anything other than that. <laughs> I think it's a terrible game because I only play single player. Well, then, yeah, it's a bad game. <laughs> <laughs> it's very frustrating and not easy and overly difficult. Uh, you can get time splitters for about twelve dollars so eh. when time splitters 2 is kind of the same price or cheaper in cases i would say just get the sequel yeah i still got my copy yeah smash is telling me that it's 35 dollars these days i think that's a big fat lie it's more like 50 to 60 <laughs> yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah maybe you can get a, a cheaper copy uh on eBay uh, with some luck, but anyways, uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna fail the first time splitters. I uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna surprise you and also fail it. Oh. Nope. <laughs> well then. Yeah, I think I'm gonna pass it myself, but not like super high pass. Okay. All right. Okay, so Colin, since it was your episode, your theme, grades, and your favorite. Uh, I guess, obviously, Smash is my favorite. And I give, I give Smash Bros. a, I guess, a B. Okay. I mean, it's a, it's a good start to a mostly great series. And Time Splitters, I'll give... Also a B. Mm. A low B. Okay. I don't know. Maybe if I'd actually played it, I'd, I'd have a different opinion. But that's that's my... Uh, those are my thoughts. Joey, what you got for me? Uh, I guess Smash would be my least hated out of the two. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll give Smash a C. I'm giving t- Time Splitters a D. Okay. Uh, yeah, I liked uh, Super Smash Bros. N64 the most. Um, you know, if I'm, it's funny. Both had very underwhelming, bad single player. But in terms of if I was to go back to the past and play the multiplayer with a bunch of friends, you know, in the late '90s, early 2000s. I would see myself having a blast with both these games and would definitely look at look at it with nostalgia way different. Um, playing them by myself definitely uh, lowers that <laughs> score quite a bit. Maybe wouldn't even play them at all. Uh, I might surprise everyone, but I'm going to give both games a C. Okay. Which uh, would, I guess, balance everything out to a C. <laughs> Uh, definitely prefer Smash Bros. Uh, over Time Splitters uh, when I compare the two, but I'm kind of looking at it as a uh, in a different perspective there. Now, in 2023 eyes, are either of these games worth going back and playing when there are clearly better games that came after it? I I can't I can't say it. That's why I'm not giving them high grades at all. But yeah, I'm I'm definitely in the in between for both those. So. Two games were Super Smash Bros. N64, the very first Time Splitters on PS2. Joey, you have the next theme pick, uh, hopefully coming out on July 30th is when we're recording next. And I have actually come up with what I'm going to do. Oh. Going to be platforming buddies. Platforming buddies. Okay. I love platforming games. And uh, you guys are my buddies, so I look forward to talking about that in the next episode. See you next time, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye now.